Voice of the Voiceless, which advocates for deprived pastors' wives and children in Africa. She is also an international speaker, recording artist, and best-selling author of Finding Joy When Life is Out of Focus, a study of Philippians for joy-thirsty women. As an ordained Assemblies of God minister and women's pastor, she serves alongside her husband, Dale, lead pastor of River of Life Worship Center in Fredericksburg, Virginia. A survivor of two near-death experiences, Reverend Donadio is passionate about motivating others to make your life matter no matter what. Please welcome Reverend Angela Donadio. What amazing praise and worship, and it's great the fact that the, all the way from New Zealand, Bev and Peter Mortlock, pastor out there, and they've got a CD at the back, at the, there's a table back there where you can get a hold of the worship and praise music, keep that presence of God in your car, and you'll enjoy it so much. Angela, first up, it, uh, you, and yeah. were, you and I were chatting the other day, and I love what you had to say, because like... I'm going to write a book one day, How to Live with Five Women, because I have four <laughs> daughters in life. But tell us a little bit about the fact that you are a bit of an adrenaline junkie. Yeah, I am. And my actual bio says an adventure junkie. So I guess I have never met an adventure I didn't like, <laughs> which means I've ridden every roller coaster I could ever get my hands on. And um, some amazing things, like I've played the piano in like 16 or 17 countries. And then some terrifying things like I was jumped on by a baboon when I was in Tanzania. So some adventures are not ones I want to repeat. You climbed Kilimanjaro. I did. I climbed Kilimanjaro with World Serve International John Bongiorno to help put clean water wells in the Maasai area. It was amazing. amazing. I loved it. Thank well, you. Well, we're glad to have you here. Thank you. Give him heaven. Give another hand for Angela. <laughs> we're ready to go. God bless you. Well, good morning. It is such an honor to be with you this morning. Hasn't this been an amazing conference, right? And we didn't want that worship to end. I could sense it too this morning. God has just been up to something he's not finished, and I am so honored to just bring a message that God specifically downloaded into my heart just for this time together. I want to thank Dr. James Davis for the invitation to be with you this week and just his vision and passion for for global missions around the world. And so I said to him last night, I heard once a pastor say to me in Africa, if you want to experience the favor of God in your life, then sow favor into the lives of others. And that's the kind of person he is. And so I believe that God has been sowing into you. And I just want to continue to just see what God wants to say to us this morning. And my topic that I was given is becoming a noteworthy leader. As I prayed over that, the Lord led me to 2 Samuel 6. So if you have God's word with you this morning, whether it's on a smartphone or a paper Bible, I would love for you to turn with me there. We're going to be looking at most of that chapter this morning. Well, in order to fulfill the Great Commission, we must follow and fight for and fulfill the call of God on our lives. So in 2 Samuel 6, we read the story of David. He's at a critical crossroads. He allowed God to take one of his most painful moments and transform it to propel him into purpose. So let's read the beginning of the story in 2 Samuel 6, beginning in verse 1. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Amminadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Amminadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord. And there were songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon... Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God, and he took a hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of the Lord. And David was angry, because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, 
And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take of the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but instead David took it aside to the house of Abedadon the Gittite, and the ark of the covenant remained at the house of Abedadon the Gittite for three months. And the Lord blessed Abedadon and all of his household. See, God defines a noteworthy leader by the posture of their heart. This passage gives us five kingdom principles that we need to fasten to our spirit if we're going to follow and fight for and fulfill the call of God in our lives. The first kingdom principle is there are no shortcuts to integrity. David did what had just been done before without seeking God. It seems so much simpler just to put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. The procession was full of pomp and circumstance, but simple and show are no substitute for personal integrity. It was no excuse to carry it that way just because the Philistines had done it and had gone unpunished. This was not what God had asked them to do. Number 7 verse 9 gives us God's original instructions for carrying the Ark of the Covenant, but Moses did not give any to the Kohathites because they were to carry on their shoulders the holy things for which they were responsible. David and this army, this group of 30,000 men, were guilty of casually carrying the glory of God. See, we don't get to carry the glory of God any way we want to. We are irresponsible with God's call when we do it our way and not his way. We will be the best versions of ourselves in public when we have spent time with Jesus in private seeking God's heart through prayer, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit and responding with obedience. See, David uses a shortcut and he shortcuts the will of God. If something is birthed in the flesh, listen, it has to be maintained in the flesh. But if it's birthed in the spirit, then it's empowered by the spirit. And when Uzzah is killed, David, the scripture says, became angry. Then he became afraid and then he became unwilling. David had the right passion and he had the right pursuit, but he had the wrong heart posture. So we could argue, but look, David had the best of intentions. I mean, they're just trying to carry the Ark of the the Covenant and get it back to the house of God. And they wanted to celebrate the presence of God. And you know, it was falling and Uzzah was just trying to steady it. I mean, they meant well. They had the best of intentions, but see, the best of intentions won't make up for a breach of integrity. The glory of God doesn't belong on the Philistines' cart. Integrity will protect you. The call of God is worth honoring in your life. See, we are called to pursue his presence and fiercely follow his voice and his will. No shortcuts. That leads us to the second kingdom principle. We need to learn to pivot when others quit. Look back at verse 12 in that same chapter. And it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Abedadom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Abedadom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, they sacrificed an ox and a fatted animal. And David danced before the Lord with all of his might. He was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. See, David realized his misstep. He had parked the ark for three months. He was crushed. He was disappointed. He felt responsible for this person's death. You know, maybe he felt like a failure. Perhaps during those three months, he asked himself, you know, where did I go wrong and how did I go wrong? I believe he looked up, how was I supposed to carry the ark of the covenant? See, mistakes are inevitable. The need for adjustments is unavoidable. But every great leader, every noteworthy leader, learns to pivot whenever you want to quit. We pivot through reexamining our motives and our methods, through listening to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and adjusting course. David chose to pivot. He did all of those things. He examined, he listened, he adjusted. When the word came that Obedidom's household was receiving the blessing that was intended for the entire nation, David was robbing them of that blessing because of his disobedience. 
And he renewed his passionate pursuit of the presence of God. That leads us to the third kingdom principle we see in this passage. If we want to have the heart posture that God can use. And that is that it will cost you something to carry the glory of God. See, in the second attempt to bring the ark, this time it's a very different journey. It had cost them something to carry God's glory. This time it wasn't simple or showy. It was sacrificial and it was sweaty. The missteps became six steps. And six steps into their journey, they stopped in reverence and offered a sacrifice in honor to the Lord. This time, they would carry the presence and the glory of God with holy honor. See, sometimes our journey to fight for and follow and fulfill the call of God in our lives becomes difficult. It becomes demanding. It's so tempting to take a shortcut. It's just so tempting to do things easier or do it the way someone else is doing it instead of seeking God's heart for you. But when it becomes difficult or demanding, it doesn't mean you've missed God. When you push through those places, it means that you understand the cost of the anointing on your life. That you're willing to do whatever it takes to pursue God's presence. It means you have traded your will for God's will. Your way for his way. Your mindset for his mindset. And when that happens, we see the fourth kingdom principle. That is that favor follows obedience. In 2001 and in 2003, I faced a similar critical crossroads like David in my life when I nearly lost my life. I had been suffering from endometriosis for many years, and the doctors had said I would never have children, but we were blessed to have two kids, now 19, 20, and 23. But after living, yeah, you can give God glory for that. <laughs> but you know, after living with chronic pain for so many years, the doctor said, listen, the only way you're really gonna be out of this excruciating pain each month is, is a hysterectomy. So I had a hysterectomy, and I was at home. My mom had come in to help. And after about a week, I was still bleeding at home, and I thought, well, that seems a little bit unusual. So I called the doctor. It was a Friday afternoon, and he said, you know, it's too late for you, for you to come in today. Why don't you just call the ER? We're sure it's nothing. We're sure they'll just see you and release you, and nothing will be wrong. To make a long story short and spare you all the gory details, while laying in a hospital room, I lost over half of my blood supply that night while I was fully awake. I remember looking at the clock in the back of the hospital room at 3.30 a.m., one of those old-fashioned clocks, just white with the black letters. It said 3.30, and I thought to myself, my doctor's not on call till 6 a.m. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. Like these kids that he gave me and this ministry that he's put in my heart, it's not going to happen. My doctor came in at 6 a.m. and they did a life-saving procedure. You know, later I was processing all that happened and I had said to the Lord, I don't ever want to feel that desperate again. And he said to me, Angela, that's the way I always want you to feel. That desperate for me. That dependent on me. <laughs> and you know, that proved to be a defining moment in my life. I, 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 be, I believe that part of me died in that hospital room, and God was using adversity to reshape me and show me that he transforms our pain into purpose. Well, I faced another season of difficulty in 2003. I was a general counsel for the Assemblies of God. I began to feel ill. You know, pastors love to eat. Have you all eaten while you're here? We eat. We meet and eat. We meet and eat and eat and meet. So I was trying to eat. Nothing would go in. I was hurting. Again, long story short, visited a number of doctors experiencing such severe abdominal pain, and nothing would, would go down. I was losing a considerable amount of weight. Finally, after many doctor's visits, I was admitted to the hospital. And just a sidebar note, I never thought about this till last month. A lot of doctors didn't take me seriously, unfortunately. And so finally, at a, at a very broken place, I went back to the doctor that had come in at 6 a.m. two years earlier, sobbing at the front desk. And I said, I need to see him. Something is dreadfully wrong. And he's the one that got me admitted in that hospital. 
And I'm not so sure that if that had not happened in 2001, that that wasn't the prevention and the way that God chose to make to get me in the hospital in 2003 so that I could be miraculously healed and saved. See, sometimes we don't know what we're going through and why, but it might be the very, the very prerequisite that God is allowing in your life for the ministry that's going to come on the other side of it. By the time I was admitted, my heart rate was dangerously low, about 39, 40 beats a minute, and my blood pressure was hovering about 75 over 40. I was dying. I was always on my left side in a fetal position. They didn't know what was wrong. They didn't know if I would need surgery. So they had me there with nothing to eat or drink, just on IV fluids for 11 days in the hospital. Test after test. And finally a doctor said, I don't know, let's just schedule an MRI. It's a barium test where you drink barium and, and it's a radioactive dye. And they see where the obstruction is. And, and they said, well, maybe that will show us something. And the test is supposed to take about 45 minutes. So my parents had flown in because the situation looked grim. My husband was upstairs in the hospital room. They wheeled me down to this cold hospital room, and I laid there on my side in a fetal position, and I watched the screen as the barium made its way into my stomach and stopped. And I heard the radiologist say, I don't know, there must be an obstruction, sit her up, turn her over, get her on all fours, drink some more, stand up, turn on her side, drink some more. And that 45-minute test turned into seven hours. I lay on that cold metal table, and I heard the audible voice of God, and he said this, Angela, I know you can worship me on the platform. I want to know if you can worship me here. And you know, everything within me wanted to say, no, I can't, and I don't like you very much right now, but see, I belong to Jesus. And he had already begun something. And I laid there on my side with tears running down my face, and I just sang, Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely. You're altogether worthy. You're altogether wonderful to me. I mean, I had led worship hundreds of times as a worship pastor. But I believe that became holy ground. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that that moment of surrender ushered in my miracle. There are no coincidences in God. And a doctor on call just happened to be studying for his board exams. And he saw my films and he saw a picture in a book. He'd never had a patient with anything like it. And he compared them and they consulted some other specialists, and within two days I had a diagnosis, superior mesenteric artery syndrome, a rare life-threatening disorder where the superior mesenteric artery takes too sharp of a right turn. It was compressing on my intestines and acting like an obstruction. So food would go into my stomach, it had nowhere to go. So they made the decision to operate a very long, complicated surgery where they took the section of intestines that was being compressed and moved it out to the side and then reconnected my stomach to a lower portion of my intestines. Now, the day of surgery was my low point. I remember thinking I didn't know if I was going to make it. I remember trying to make a joke with the doctor, saying bye to my husband. After that surgery, I spent months unable to eat solid food. I was healing from the trauma. I was adjusting to a scar that runs the length of my torso. And even in those dark days, God was breathing hope back into my withered spirit. See, nothing happens to us that isn't filtered through the loving hands of our Heavenly Father first. So instead of asking why, I begin to ask, okay, what do I need to learn from this? And how are you going to use it for your glory? He was teaching me how to carry the glory of God, His way and not mine, dependent on him, surrendered in him through worship and obedience. See, your obedience is your worship. God takes the sounds we struggle to surrender, and he composes a beautiful melody from a submitted heart. We offer him brokenness, and he writes hope. His heavenly melodies are crafted from our tender places made sacred through surrender. 
Obedience is part of the process to become a noteworthy leader with a hard posture that God can trust to carry the glory of God. See, God chooses the process. We choose obedience. God crafts the vessel he wants to use, and it's often messy and painful and confusing, and then he uses the vessel that he crafts. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 tells us that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show us that this surpassing power is from God and not from us. We don't carry the ark across our shoulders and sacrifice bulls to pursue the presence of God. We don't have to wait once a year for a high priest to go in and sprinkle blood on that mercy seat to make atonement for our sin because we serve the living God. We serve the living God and Jesus Christ once and for all became the sacrifice so that we can boldly approach the throne in our time of need. And the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you. You are the jar. You are the vessel. You are the container that is carrying the glory of God. Well, what does that look like? What does it look like when our favor, when God's favor follows our obedience? It looks like kingdom purpose. I followed and I fought for and I'm continuing to try to seek to fulfill God's call on my life. His purpose for me now includes empowering women as I author Bible studies that help women ground themselves in the word instead of the narrative of the world. And it looks like 20 trips across Africa to bring the message of the gospel to unengaged, unreached people groups to encourage and strengthen indigenous pastors and their wives. As the founder of Voice of the Voices, I work closely with hundreds of rural pastors' wives traveling to so many of their villages, sitting face to face to hear their stories. I help empower them through micro-enterprise programs and opportunities, training, so that their lives can be improved, their husbands' lives can be improved, their, their communities can be impacted, because as goes the church, goes the community. When favor follows obedience, for me, it's been looked like being used as an advocate for those who often cannot speak for themselves. I stand here with their fingerprints all over my life. Thousands of children that I've written and directed kids camps for who have received the message of the gospel, investing in repairing Bible colleges, putting mattresses on the floor for Bible students who travel from so far with nowhere to sleep, including taking at that time my 72-year-old father to Africa for the first time to minister in Tanzania at a spiritual emphasis. Looks like women's conferences, Feels like sleeping in mud huts and wearing hiking boots to climb Mount Kilimanjaro to put in clean water wells. It sounds like singing at a Christ for All Nations campaign and experiencing the miraculous with one of my heroes, Reinhard Bonnke, before he finished his race. And it feels like traveling by canoe to a remote village in northern Ghana, Deboya, 95% Muslim village to stand with shaking hands in one of my first trips to Africa to share the gospel to a Muslim chief and his six wives and what he said were his uncountable children. It looks like 26 years of marriage to my husband Dale is here with me, raising two children to follow Jesus at all cost and serving side by side in ministry, 25 of those years pastoring the same church, raising up and releasing leaders at River of Life, Virginia. It looks like commitment and choices to pivot when it's so much easier sometimes to quit. Well, what does it look like when favor follows obedience? It looks like planting a church in that remote village of Neboya four years ago. It looks like pivoting when only a year into that church plant, our pastor was tragically killed on a motorcycle accident. Everybody thought we would quit. But obedience resulted in open door. My son at the time was 18. We came back and we began the construction on a building there in Deboya, which has now grown to 21 churches planted in the surrounding area with a total of, of almost 1,100 members. See, that's what it looks like when favor follows obedience. So finally, we have to care more about celebrating the kingdom than cowering to criticism. Let's finish the story in verse 16. As the ark of the Lord came in the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in, his heart, in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord, and they set in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. He's dancing. He's blessing the people. And if you skip down, Michael says, well, how the king of Israel honored himself today. 
how distinguished are you? And he said, you know what? I'll become more undignified than this. It was me that God anointed over your father, Saul. And I'll be honored in those eyes of those servant girls. I'm not going to stop worshiping because you don't like it. See, we have to care more about celebrating the kingdom of God than cowering to criticism. David comes into town. He had followed God's call. He had paid the price for it. He had completed the mission to bring the presence of God back to the area. And he comes into town with a celebration. He's dancing with all of his might. And he's met with sharp disapproval by Michael, his wife. See, Michael wanted David to be worshipped. And David knew he was created to worship. And the anointing and the presence of God mattered, him, mattered to him more than anything else. See, that's the heart posture of a noteworthy leader. He celebrated that the vision had come to pass. Listen, the fear of the Lord must mean more to us than the criticism or the praise of men. We must be willing to fulfill God's purpose at all cost. Just like Michael, some people will despise you for your celebration. They will criticize you for your vision. And I believe as I close this morning, this is a prophetic word for those of you that are here this morning at Synergize. God will enable you to stand strong in the face of criticism, to follow and fight for and fulfill the call of God. And it will be worth it. Your innovative approach, it will be worth it. Your painful past, it will be worth it. Your stand for integrity, it will be worth it. Your unorthodox idea, it will be worth it. Your sacrifice and all that has cost you will be worth it. Your choice to pivot and not quit, it will be worth it. Your willingness to be the container that carries the glory of God, it will be worth it. Maybe you know immediately those defining moments that have stood at a crossroads in your life, like those I shared in my life. Those moments where we allow God to take our most painful experiences, we surrender it to him in worship, and we let him transform our pain into purpose. Or maybe you're here today, and you're at a crossroads. Maybe you feel buried under the weight of responsibility. You feel crushed or confused by a misstep. Maybe you need the strength, and you need the grace to turn that misstep into six steps. You need the guidance to pivot and not to quit. Maybe the sting of criticism has just become almost too much for you to bear. You started questioning the vision. You've even started to wonder if you're the person to do it. Listen, favor will follow your obedience. Your season of celebration is on the other side of your obedience. We must follow. We must fight for. We must fulfill the call of God in our lives. He will transform your pain. He will rest his favor on your obedience, and he will propel you into kingdom purpose. I wrote this in my latest Bible study, Fearless. Your greatest opportunity to shape a culture is to do exactly what God has called you to do. Some of us will travel the globe until our passport cannot hold another stamp to take a stand for justice. Others of us will travel the stairs in our home until the carpet is threadbare to take care of our children. What makes us strong is not what we do, but whether we do what God has uniquely called us to do. Make the decision to obey God at all costs. Because when obedience is our criteria, we all win. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. I want to pray over you. I just want to ask you, are you willing? Are you willing to let God choose the process and you choose obedience are you willing to be the container that he is crafting listen you're carrying the glory of God you're carrying the glory of God and because you carry the glory of God the glory of God will carry you we have a moment and so I just want this place to become an altar of worship can we just sing that simple chorus that I sang in the hospital room? And can you make it the prayer of your heart this morning? Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together you're all together wonderful to God.
Come on, sing it to him again. Tell him, lift your hands. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am. We say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. All together worthy. All together. You're wonderful to me, and I exalt thee. I am. We magnify you, Jesus. We lift you up, Jesus. And I am for the sake of your glory, Jesus. Oh. And I exalt, have your glory, King of glory, have your glory. I exalt, I magnify you, Lord. I exalt thee. Oh. Jesus, we just thank you that you would choose to use us. God, I pray for any space in us that needs to be crafted, that you can use us for your glory. Carry those of us that need to be carried this morning, God, so that we can carry your glory. We can carry what you've asked us to carry, God, with honor, not irresponsibly, with integrity, Jesus, for your glory, for the sake of your name. We exalt you, we magnify you, we live for you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. God bless you.